Thanks, Tim. Um, I'd like to welcome you all to MPL. I should have given a safety announcement prior to Tim's talk, I think. Um, if you hear the fire alarm go off, then you just follow the route that you came to this room in reverse and stand on the grassy bit outside. Um, but I doubt very much that that's going to happen. So I'm going to be discussing um, identifying and quantifying sources of uncertainty, as Tim said. Good, that works. Um, before I do so, I'd like to... Oops, no, sorry. Okay, I'd like to thank um, various of my MPL colleagues who I've uh, discussed some of the things that I'm going to be talking about with. So the aim of this presentation is to answer um, the first of three key points that you need to understand if you're going to carry out a stochastic finite element analysis, and that's how do I know what the input uncertainties are. I think the other talks that we'll be having today will be more on the methods and how you look at the results, but I think it's useful to understand how you get what you put in. So the first real question is why are input uncertainties necessary? And there are two reasons for this. The first is that models are based, and um, the first is that models are based on um, measurement values, and measurement values should all have an uncertainty associated with them um, due to natural variability. And the second is that models are also based on assumed values. Whenever you create a model, you make simplifications, you make assumptions, you make guesses about the way things might behave, and you need to take the uncertainty associated with that into account. Measurement uncertainty is something that the National Physical Laboratory is very concerned with. Um, if a measurement's repeated, then you can expect the measured values to be different <coughs> due to the reasons listed there. Um, your measuring instrument's going to have drift or calibration issues. The item being measured may not be stable itself. It may be affected by its environment. And a lot of these uh, issues also affect model uncertainties. So the environment in particular is something that you tend to simplify about. Um, I was hoping that Jacek's presentation was going to define these terms, but since he's not here, it's just as well that I've got this slide. Um, we look at, we tend to separate uncertainties into two different types. The first is random uncertainties, which is um, typified by the scatter shown in the arrows at the top, and that's basically quantified by a, a, un, a, by a standard deviation. Um, and the second type is more to do with accuracy issues. So you've got values close together, but they're offset from the centre. Normally, you'd remove all of the um, accuracy issues, but in some cases, you're not able to describe them sufficiently well to remove them. So you have to take them into account as an uncertainty rather than an error. <clears throat> the way we approach um, uncertainty evaluation within the measurement community is to create something called an uncertainty budget. This gives you a kind of structure to um, know that you've taken everything into account. It consists of a list of all the sources of uncertainty and um, assigns a probability, de a probability density function to each of those sources. And then usually um, the budget allows you to propagate the PDFs as well and combine them. But the question that you have to ask yourself is, given a set of information, how do I know what PDF to assign? And that's what I'm going to explain a little bit more about. Fortunately, there are methods that exist, um, the two main ones being the principle of maximum entropy and Bayes' theorem. So the principle of maximum entropy um, is valuable when you've got some testable information about the distribution. By testable information, I mean information that you can get directly from the distribution, so things like means, standard deviations, percentiles, things like that, um, not <coughs> direct samples of the distribution that you might get if you were making measurements. And the principle of maximum entropy minimises the entropy, um, subject to the constraints given by the information. The definition of entropy there is a generalisation of the form used in information theory and is kind of slightly related to um, thermodynamic entropy as well. And this method enables you to build a distribution that matches only the given information, so you're attempting to not add any further assumptions about what your quantity might be doing. Um, unfortunately, there are known solutions um, that minimise that quantity for common sets of information. <coughs> 
So, for example, if you happen to know limits on your value, but that's all the information that you have, then the best distribution you can apply is a uniform distribution. This is convenient because often all you've got is uh, limits or tolerances on the value that you're interested in. If, on the other hand, you've got an estimate, if, uh, if on the other hand, you know the mean and the standard deviation of the quantity that you're interested in, then your best bet's always the normal distribution. And again, that's convenient because it's easy to use. Bayes' theorem, on the other hand, is useful when you've got a set of realisations of the quantity that you're interested in. And you can make the assumption that these are independent samples from a Gaussian distribution that you don't know the expectation or the variance of. Um, so if you apply a Bayes' theorem to that situation, then you can make an estimate of the mean, um, as you'd expect, using the formula on the left, an estimate of the variance using the formula on the right, and then you can assume that the distribution is a t-distribution um, of the form stated there. Now, you might expect that it would be a Gaussian distribution because you've assumed that the samples are coming from a Gaussian distribution, but it isn't because um, you're having to estimate both the quantities and that means you need to add a bit more width to the distribution and you can show that a T distribution is actually a better estimator. But this tends towards the normal distribution as you'd expect as the number of samples increases. So in terms of um, applying the uncertainty budget to a finite element model, you can pretty much use the same ideas as we use without adapting them. And the first problem is to make a list of the sources and then assign the PDFs to them. There are four main areas that you need to consider when you're making that list, and those are the equations, the domain, the material properties, and the boundary conditions and loads. And I'll go into some of the issues that affect each of those in the rest of this talk. So in general, you would assume that the equations that you've got are as good as possible, but inevitably these are going to involve simplification. Um, you tend to decouple multiphysics problems so that you're only looking at one aspect or treating it as two sequential problems. You tend to treat a, what should be a transient problem as a static problem because it'll solve better. And that you tend to neglect the environment in general. And all of these things inevitably um, lead to a simpler model. The only way you can really quantify uh, how, how right your equations might be is by comparison with experiment. And there's been a recent paper in Metrologia listed there <coughs> that gives you a method of doing this that's consistent with our approach to uncertainty evaluation in general. But overall, with equations, the hope would be that this is not a significant source of uncertainty and that you can pretty much neglect it. If you do find out it's a significant source, I'd say it suggested the model needs reconsidering more than anything else. It's a validation issue. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the second thing you need to consider is the domain. So manufacturing processes will cause shape uncertainties associated with objects. And typically, in addition to those uncertainties, the model's made up of multiple parts, so you end up with positioning uncertainties, alignment issues, angle problems, that kind of thing. If you've got bought-in parts, um, ideally, although not necessarily in practice, your supplier would specify tolerances, so you could treat those as limits and just assign a rectangular distribution. But with in-house parts and um, assemblies, in general, you'd need to use measurement to try and understand the uncertainties associated um, with those objects. Another problem that affects um, large-scale models, um, electromagnetic models and acoustic models in particular, is domain truncation. In a lot of cases, you'd like to be able to model an infinite domain, but you tend not to be able to do that. Um, you end up using boundary conditions to simulate it or just making it big enough that it's nearly infinite. And that has an uncertainty associated with it. And you can kind of get limits on that by increasing the size of the model or by using error estimators that exist. So in terms of um, shape measurement, this is freeform metrology. And there are two main classes of technique that we use here. We have contact measurements, where you have a spherical probe tip that scans across the surface of an object, measures the, and the center of the probe tip has its position measured throughout, and then you tend to fit a prismatic description or a CAD model to the measurement data afterwards. 
Now, the problem with that is it takes quite a long time because you have to scan across the surface, move a bit, scan again. Um, with optical techniques, you can gather a very large amount of data in one sweep. Um, you scan the shape with a set of light fringes and you get a point cloud out of that. You do that from several different angles and then knit the different surfaces together and you get a picture overall of how the object, how the surface of the object looks. And you can fit surfaces, CAD models, things like that to that subsequently. But both of these measurement techniques have uncertainties associated with them. So you can see on the left there, there's a picture of a typical contact probe. Um, and the main, source of us, the main sources of uncertainty associated with contact measurement are basically to do with the relationship between um, where the probe tip actually is, where the centre of the probe tip is, where you think it is, and where the point of contact between the surface and the centre of the tip are in relation to one another. So things like probe stiffness and the scanning motion and the choice of scan lines all affect um, the uncertainties associated with contact measurement. And for the optical techniques, the main source of uncertainty is the optical compliance of the surface, so whether or not the surface is scattering light in the way that you think it is. Um, in addition, the camera characteristics and the algorithms for joining the data sets together have a large effect. In terms of material properties, um, whenever you choose a material model, you're automatically making <coughs> assumptions and there are uncertainties associated with those. You tend to neglect dependencies on things like temperature and strain rate, but those will have an effect. And there tends to be assumptions about isotropy and homogeneity that may not be valid. The only way you can really characterise those is um, trying to make your model one step more complicated, rerunning and then comparing to your simplified version. And again, that will give you kind of limits on the behaviour that you can characterise as a uniform distribution. <coughs> In addition to that, you've got the uncertainties that are associated with the material model parameters themselves. Now, often these aren't quoted in literature values. If you go to the steel handbook and things like that, it tends to just quote single unique value for the majority of properties, occasionally with some limits on it, but there's not really a proper characterisation of these things. Um, but the values tend to be significant even for fairly straightforward, simple parameters. And then finally, you've got the problem that some materials, things like um, some forms of composites and soils and things like that, are inherently random. OK, um, so an example of uncertainties associated with material properties comes when you consider Young's modulus. Um, what you can see in this plot is two is stress-strain curves from two tensile tests on nominally the same material. And whilst Young's modulus is easy to explain in words, it's the slope of a straight line fitted to the straight part of a tensile test curve, it's difficult to obtain in practice. So there are a couple of things to note. The first is that the repeatability between those two curves isn't particularly good, even though they were carried out by um, experienced metrologists. The second is it's kind of difficult to say where the straight line part of that curve is, particularly for the red curve. So you can see it's got a very small, it's got a very small um, straightish bit there, but it's difficult to say where the straight bit's actually going to end, whether it's going to be, you know, up here or a little bit further down. And the values of the modulus that you get out of um, those two curves are quite different from one another, you can see by the dotted lines that have been drawn on there. And the problem with this is that it has a knock-on effect on all of the other calculations that you might be going to make with that tensile data, because um, most of the characteristics that you might be interested in for plasticity involve being able to get at the plastic strain, which means subtracting off the elastic strain, and the elastic strain is determined directly from the Young's modulus. That means if you've got a bit of an iffy Young's modulus, everything else is going to come out a bit iffy. And you can see that on this plot here, um, because there's uncertainty in the slope, <coughs> then there's knock-on effects um, causing uncertainty in the uh, other two parameters listed there. And there's been an EU project on this kind of data recently um, called 10 Stand. I've got details of that if anybody's interested. And the final thing that you need to consider is the uncertainties associated with your boundary conditions and loads. 
Um, some loads obviously are inherently random and need to be characterised that way, so seismic loading, wind loading and some forms of vibrational loading. Typically you'll take the worst case load, but in some cases that can tend to be an overly conservative approach. Some loadings you can define with magnitude and direction uncertainties, um, impact tests in particular, that's a common approach. But the main problem in a lot of cases is uncertainty due to interpolation or extrapolation because commonly you've got a set of point measurements and you need to turn those into a condition over an entire surface. So you end up with interpolation uh, problems. So if we've got a set of discrete measurements and we want to generate a condition over a surface, um, we might be lucky enough that physical insight suggests a model. And in that case, we can take the uncertainties associated with the point measurements and propagate them through that model to get the uncertainties associated with the values at the other points. An alternative approach, if you haven't got a physical model, is to use Gaussian processes. Um, these offer a more general model by defining a spatial or indeed temporal correlation structure, um, which basically says the closer two points are together, the more strongly they are related. Um, they're used by the Met Office and are in, on the rise in general, I think. And the useful thing about this is they have an inbuilt uncertainty calculus, so you don't have to bother propagating the uncertainties um, through the model that you've got. And the other approach you can use is kind of a hybrid of the two. So you can use your known physical model to cover most things, but then you can add in um, a Gaussian processes model to cope with unknown uncertainty, unknown systematic effects that combines the best of both worlds, really. In terms of load measurement, um, what you can see on the left there is a, is a load cell. Uh, it's about 30 centimetres tall, that one, and they measure force from strain gauge networks. And because they're a transfer standard, many of the sources of uncertainty within them have been eliminated by design. Um, we have other devices for load force available, where the main problem is the bonding between the device and the object. And these are directly traceable back to the SI, unlike some other approaches. So they can be um, useful to try to characterise your loads more accurately and get good uncertainties associated with them. So the final thing, once you've got the list, is typically the list is very long and you don't want to have to deal with all of the uncertainties um, that you've listed. Usually you only want to consider the important parameters as uncertain. And there's two points that determine the importance. Um, the first is how big is the parameter uncertainty? Well, you've already characterised that. And the second is how sensitive is the model result to the parameter value? And this means that you're going to need a sensitivity coefficient, which is defined as the partial derivative of the result that you're interested in with respect to the parameter. But these are kind of difficult to get. Um, you can use numerical approximation, but that means more model runs, and you don't want to have to do that um, before you do your uncertainty analysis. But you can generally get an order of magnitude approximation directly from the equations <coughs> that can tell you whether or not the parameter is going to be significant, whether or not you need to worry about it, and can help you filter the list in general. So to summarise, um, the approach is to make a list of all possible sources of uncertainty, to characterise the sources by either measurement, which has its own um, uncertainties associated with it, or application of expert knowledge to get some information, and then apply the principle of maximum entropy or Bayes' theorem to get a distribution to associate with each of those sources of uncertainty. Decide if you can neglect any of the sources, and then you can go on to the calculation stage, which I think is what Dietmar is going to discuss rather more. Um, finally, I'd just like to um, recommend some suggested reading if any of that's been of interest. The document at the top, the Guide to the Expression of Uncertainty in Measurement, is kind of the uncertainty bible for measurement scientists. Then there's a UCAS document, um, and MPL's produced various guides and modelling pub uh, publications that might be able to help you out a bit. So that's me. Thanks. Thank